The will to DIY is a workbench for a writer to play with ideas, play with his friends, and pretend to be smart. Welcome back to another multi-part podcast. Sponsored by the Reflective Intelligence Meter. We use this device daily, and between parts two and three of the podcast, you'll learn more about how you can get yours. Buy one now. Buy one now. Last week, we talked about positive and negative freedom, rules for communication, and the social contract. As in, maybe we should be good people and help out others in our society. This is a DIY podcast, very much do-it-yourself, so there's some real systemic problems that need to be looked at, worked on, repaired, fixed, uh, and there's things we need to fight. But a lot of that starts with awareness and research and then modifying our behavior and our actions. Today we're talking about surveillance, control, and power. In short, the panopticon. Originally, this referred to a prison design. Uh, Now it refers to all sorts of ideas of surveillance, control, Big Brother watching you, the thought police disciplining you. It's really kind of synonymous now with paranoia and dystopic themes. When I was younger and I read books like 1984 and Brave New World, all these dystopias, the assumption was that Brave New World, uh, it might be more prescient because the idea of hedonistic ambivalence spreading, it's a much easier sell than the sort of authoritative regime of stomping on people that's displayed in 1984. But what if, now that technology is caught up, we can get both at once? <gasps> a super dystopia. Part 1. Some history. A man walks into bars. But because he's in prison, these are actual bars and it really hurts. Now this guy of course wants out of prison. He wants the freedom from confinement. He wants the freedom to do what he wants. So, while under the guise of doing lots and lots of push-ups to get super buff like Nicolas Cage in Con Air, one of his favorite movies, he digs a tunnel while no one's looking, just like in another one of his favorite movies, Shawshank Redemption. Now, seriously, if you're back in the 1700s or 1800s and you don't have the manpower technology, how are you going to prevent somebody from doing something like this while you're not looking? Well, this guy named Jeremy Bentham, a philosopher and a social reformer who has kind of utilitarian views, he steps in in the 1790s and says, I have designed the perfect prison. You don't even need a guard to watch the prisoners all the time. And everyone says, "Uh, how's that possible, right? We don't believe you. And he says, well, there's this kind of philosophy and psychology behind it. He says that power must be one, visible, and two, unverifiable. And of course, to me, this seems like a contradiction because if I see something... It's visible, and therefore I have verified it. So maybe to see how you make something visible and unverifiable, we can look at his panopticon. This prison design is really sort of a tiered stadium of prison cells with a central tower. From the tower, the guard can see into all the cells, and all the prisoners, of course, can see the tower, but the prisoners can't see each other. So the tower acts as a visible symbol. So check, you've got visible, but it's kind of symbolic. Now, how do you do the unverifiable part? The tower, it's kind of like a lighthouse that functions as a one-way mirror where the prisoners can't actually see into the observation booth on this tower. Thus, they can never actually verify that there's somebody watching them. They just have to assume they're being watched. And thus, they behave as if they're always being watched. I mean, this is the same concept as Santa Claus or maybe once you're a grown-up, the idea of God, right? But anyway, this prison is brilliantly sadistic. You can almost hear the maniacal chuckle. Uh, But in reality, this was really a very smart, efficient, and rational solution for a very specific problem of dealing with prisoners. In part two, we're going to see now how this is used on all the citizens all the time. Part two, Michel Foucault. So after vacating the prison through a sewer and on his way to Zewatanil, Our escapee walks into a bar. You knew that was coming, right? Here he asks for a beer, but when the bartender asks him for his ID, he notices he has unfortunately lost his pants in the escape attempt through the sewer. He doesn't have a wallet, much less pants. And you know, he's really been having a long day and he's pretty frustrated with this petty legalism. So he sort of loses his shit and starts ranting about this invisible man in the tower and something about Rita Hayworth posters. And all the while he's doing push-ups like Nicolas Cage, of course. And he kind of forgets that his junk is hanging out. Well, I mean, this is all very understandable to those of us who know his backstory. He has had a long day. 
but no one in the bar really understands, and so they call the local asylum and they have him committed. Foucault discusses prisons and asylums. The asylum is a place where madness or non-normative behavior could be dealt with, hidden from public view. It's really quite similar to prisoners in a prison, and from there they experiment on ways to make the prisoners, sorry, I mean subjects, obey. Sorry, I mean reform. This is a huge shift from the way power used to work. In the opening of his book Discipline and Punish, a king has a public spectacle of torturing and killing a man simply so he can verify his power in a very visible way to all of his citizens. Well, now power has evolved. It has learned a thing or two, really. It focuses on spaces and relations to form discursive interactions. Or basically, if you set up the right dynamic in a space, like an invisible guard in a prison... People with a little bit of training will discipline themselves. One major difference is we have increasingly made it taboo to touch the body. People just won't forgive that. So our poor escapee doing push-ups, he's now surveilled from a one-way mirror or a CCTV, and they collect data on him, and they observe the body, and this transforms the body into a cognitive object. Basically, we're analyzing the body's behavior and we modify our interactions based on it until we can train the mind. So you might say we torture, I'm sorry, I mean discipline the mind to enact the normalized standards of behavior. Eventually, after being trained long enough, the individual person, I'm sorry, I mean cognitive object, internalizes these standards and they take on the role of self-discipline, not even allowing the self to think a thought that is non-normative. So while Foucault shows us this system in action in controlled spaces, he also opens it up to how power is manifested through panoptic surveillance in almost all facets of society. Everyone has had a nurse, doctor, teacher, or an office manager that sets up a surveillance discourse. And this is where they're checking in on you to give you feedback, to see if you're doing well or doing poorly, and really they're quite nice, and they end up making these suggestions to help you out. And over time, this surveillance discourse instills the normative behavior where you surveil and police yourself to their standards, making yourself into a highly efficient cog in their institution. Now, the more disgusting part about this is, of course, it spreads within the institutions to where everyone's surveilling each other. So your coworkers, Karen or Kevin, they might rat you out to get a pat on the head from some mid-level authority figure or boss who only wants pats on the head from her boss, who only wants a pat on the butt from the board member or investor, and really they only wanted to make their dad proud, etc., etc., So power has evolved to become less visible and less verifiable. It has become more and more bureaucratic, diffuse, and abstract. There really is no king now. A lot of this surveillance, discipline, and punishment, and the really diffuse, passive-aggressive power that we see in mid-level bureaucracies is played out really well in King Kesey's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Randall Murphy in the movie version, this is Jack Nicholson's character, he's a recidivist who just won't take to the training and he's busy trying to wake up the crushed spirits of those around him until this mid-level authority figure of Nurse Ratchet engages in some, quote, discursive interactions that end up involving drugging him, electroshock, a lot of petty policies taking fun away, and eventually, for the good of the subject and society, she has McMurphy lobotomized. The difficulty with this is, if you're his friend and you want justice for McMurphy, well, sure, you can throttle Nurse Ratchet, but she's not the one that performed the lobotomy. She's not the one that sent McMurphy to jail in the first place. She's really a cog in a grand panoptic system that also surveilled, disciplined, and punished her. And now, as such a good, efficient worker, she rewards herself with punishing others. Excuse us as we take a break from this programming for a word from our sponsor, the inventor of the reflective intelligence meter. The Panopticon. Opti to view pan everything. Con. Well, maybe it's not a great idea. Doctor Strange would know what I'm talking about. Either way, it's very good to purchase your reflective intelligence meter. Just a reflective intelligence device that'll also register how much 
intelligence you've reflected during the day. It's like a step meter where you're not walking up and down stairs, but you're having to deal with the ups and downs of social and commercial repercussions. If you reflect enough of the bombardment of binary difficulties to your social life, then you will be awarded a gift card of non-ill repute. This gift card will allow you to get out of Panopticon for free and other wonderful amenities, mostly how much money you pay for gas. It's all related, you know. These panopticons and old dragons melted into black energy along with the plants that they ate. Vegetarianism has got nothing on this panopticonism. Well, actually, it's not really related. Other than plants, if they had googly eyes attached by a character of Christopher Walken's demise, then possibly they could view you while you watered them. Excuse me, I must water my plants. Buy one now for only three easy payments and one complicated payment. Patent not pending. Buy now while gasoline lasts. Buy one now. Buy one now. Part 3. Tony Bennett. Our former prisoner and now mental patient, tired of being told to stop doing push-ups and being told how to live by people who really aren't alive, these are just trained automatons punching clocks, he channels his inner chief Bromden, and he rips a water fountain out of the wall and he throws it through the window to escape. Fleeing, once again pantless, hospital row billowing open behind him, he wonders where he should go. And he thinks to himself, where can you be accepted as normal even if you're half naked and crazy? Aha, uh-huh, I know, the art world. So he strolls into a museum. After being bored by staring at cardboard boxes on the walls and candy for some reason on the floors, and some of the most boring movies he's ever seen, he sits down to stare at a water fountain contemplating his recent escape. Soon he's surrounded by museum patrons also staring at the water fountain. Suddenly they're vying for his attention. And this wild-haired man in a robe, I mean, he must be a famous artist, only Julian Schnabel could get away with that outfit. He hears something about the profound bravery of Duchamp's fountain reverting back into a fountain. And he hears something about the implications of the dispotif of Delusian rhizomatic actor network theory. And eventually, surrounded by these people, he is declared the artist of this new fountain, simply by his ability to point his eyeballs. And he becomes famous. So he's no longer crazy. He's famous. So in the super dark panoptic discursive power relation world we've been talking about where there's a lot of punishment and discipline. Well, this doesn't actually account for all of our behavior. I mean, what happens in our free time? This is, after all, a DIY podcast. What does societal conditioning look like when it involves the larger public making choices for themselves when they're not under the thumb of their manager? A sociologist named Tony Bennett brings this up as kind of this counterpoint that dovetails into Foucault's more contained authoritative panopticon. Bennett points out that while the prisoners may be punished in private, the trial is quite open to the public. So the visible spectacle is still on display. And maybe you were no longer forced to verify the visible power of the king, but now we, the public, can selectively proffer the power of our gaze wherever we want. I mean, it's almost as if they've trained us to recognize the observation effect or Hawthorne effect creates a power dynamic. And by observing things and people the way we have been panoptically surveilled and trained ourselves, we now know that our spectatorship confers power. Bennett says that some institutions opened up for this public spectatorship and they had their own more subtle means of panoptic control. He called this the exhibitionary complex. In public exhibits like Crystal Palace or the Eiffel Tower, these big things put on by the state, or perhaps even at a museum that once hoarded private objects and now shows them to the public, he argues there's a combination of spectacle and surveillance in which the public understands a role is to both see and be seen, and they understand the flows of the power dynamic. 
So now you not only see the water fountain, you also need to be seen seeing the water fountain, right? And on something like the Eiffel Tower, you see it, but you also climb up it and you observe panoptically outwards while people around you and people on the ground also look up and observe you as part of the spectacle. In this example, the state apparatus empowers itself through our willingness to see, to be seen, and to participate in their visible spectacle of power. And we can still really not quite verify how to rebel against this power. As Bratton says, architecture is the body of the state, and someone abuses or tortures this visible body, such as a 9-11 attack, you simply train power how to react, how to create alternate architectures and new bodies. But I think this is equally interesting in the role of the individual in their hobby time, away from the, quote, tyranny of work, wherein we perform in public spectacles that only reaffirm the existing power of normative standards. And I think increasingly we know we're being panoptically surveilled by institutions as well as our peers. We've become so well trained that many people embody a beyond normative role, exaggerating their behaviors to gain more and more attention from the gaze. They're essentially acting the part they think others want to see for the gaze. So they don't just align with the power ethos, they work in their free time to expand it. And yet at the end of the day, these social dynamics are also contextual. It's not only rah-rah flag-waving, fireworks, and gun-toting for the gaze of the world for you and your peers. It's also on smaller scales and in alternate contexts where we're empowering a crazy man in a museum as a verified genius for wearing a bathrobe while staring at plumbing. I think we all know the emperor has no clothes, but the more distressing aspect is knowing that we're being seen and we continue to participate in behaviors that work to amplify the panopticon and the contradictory standards of the behaviors it creates. All right, thank you for putting up with this episode. Next show, we're going to discuss more about the post-panopticon, which is basically a panopticon plus surveillance technology and capitalism as it amplifies the stakes of everything. And many, many thanks to Mr. Lisa for the intro and our sponsor, Jonathan Whitfield. Please go out and buy your reflective intelligence meter today. As always, if this podcast generated a smile or made you consider something in a new or alternate way, then please leave me a comment or share this effort with your friends. Thank you.